he did two things for me. He bought me a battery operated record player um, when I was a kid, probably paid 50 bucks for it. And he bought me Doc Severinsen albums. So when I would work in the warehouse, I had Doc Severinsen albums playing all the time. And so I had music going all the time. I was listening to Doc and man, I still got all those command albums. And then I was able to practice my horn out there, but it was great. He taught me, he taught me discipline. He taught me reliability. He taught me the importance of respect. He taught me so much, you know, uh, yeah, no right way to do a wrong thing is what he always told me. Hello, everyone. Welcome to Everything Band, a podcast that features conversations with composers, conductors, and performers of music for winds and percussion. My name is Mark Connor. I'm a composer and educator, and each week I have the great fortune to speak with and share the stories and wisdom of musicians and leaders in the band community. I'd like to acknowledge Vandercook College of Music for sponsoring this episode. With a world-class faculty, a location just minutes from downtown Chicago, and an intensive summers-only master's program, it's no wonder Vandercook College of Music has graduates teaching music in all 50 states, 21 countries, and six continents. Make next summer your most inspiring summer yet by pursuing a master's in music education at Vandercook College of Music. And for the next generation of music educators, Vandercook offers an exceptional, comprehensive four-year Bachelor of Music Education program. Vandercook admissions information is available at www.vandercook.edu. Before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for listening. I appreciate your time, and I hope that you are finding value from these interviews. I rely on word of mouth and social media to bring the show to new listeners. If you think you know one or two people who might find these interviews useful, please let them know about it. You can also help by following me and sharing posts on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Remember, help students live up to the best that is in them through music. And now on to the episode and this week's guest, Charlie Mangini. Hi, Charlie. Hi, Mark. How are you? I'm doing really well. Thank you for joining me. Well, thank you for the invitation. This is quite an honor. So, Charlie, you are a fairly well-known name in the in the band community, but could you take a few minutes and introduce yourself for the listeners? Sure. I'm uh, Dr. Charles T. Mangini, but my mother called me Charlie, and that's good uh, for everybody. And because uh, it was good enough for her, it's good enough for everybody. But I grew up in uh, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, Iron Mountain, Michigan, which is about 100 miles north of Green Bay, Wisconsin. And uh, my father was a, um, a, a small businessman. He was a candy wholesaler and uh, would work with uh, grocery stores and gas stations and things like that. But he had a he had a love of music, and he would take me as a kid up to hear the um, local community band, the Dickinson County Area Band, and I would go and listen to their rehearsals with him and had an older brother who was playing in it at the time and and would go to the concerts on Wednesday night. And, and he always exposed me to music. He had Lawrence Welk on every Saturday night. And, and when I was in third grade, my dad said, well, you know, you need to play a, an instrument. And I said, well, I'd love to play an instrument. My brother played the clarinet, and he says, you know, your Uncle Joe – has an old cornet. He said, I think we can borrow that and you can try that for a while. So sure enough, my Uncle Joe had an old Con Constellation cornet and I got the cornet and I took lessons from the local music teacher, Steria Dries. I drove about a mile and a half to her house or rode my bike depending upon the weather and and she would teach everybody every instrument. She knew all the instruments and I started with her in third grade and kept going and my father bought me a, a new instrument about sixth grade he bought me a used Olds ambassador trumpet and uh, uh, I just kept playing kept taking lessons with Mrs. Dries and then I got into seventh grade and and the band director there was a guy by the name of Francis Caviani and he was an amazing guy um, and I remember walking into my seventh grade band room one day and he had uh, this recording playing and I, I was like oh my god this is heavenly and it was stan kenton with maynard ferguson playing trumpet and and mr caviani was a trumpet player too and he kind of looked at me he says he's pretty good isn't he i said yeah he said I mean, he says someday maybe you can play like that and he kind of laughed and i mean it just it was transforming that just listen to that recording tra was transforming and mr caviani was there my seventh grade year and in fact i saw him a couple months ago back in my hometown where I've retired to. And he's uh, dealing with a severe case of Parkinson's. It's pretty sad. But he came up to me and he said, uh, I've got something for you. Next time I see you, I'll have it with me. And sure enough, about a week later, I saw him and, and he 
opens up his uh, his wallet or his coat, and he hands me this piece of paper. And it was my seventh grade band program. And he and I was guest conducting the Notre Dame Victory March that he had arranged for the seventh grade band. And he said, do you remember this? And I said, yeah, I sure do. And and he gave me this program. And it's like one of my cherished keepsakes in life, you know, because this guy was like such an amazing teacher. Well, uh, I was I went to solo and ensemble contest as a seventh grader and we were at Northern Michigan University. And. Uh, at the end of the day, before they'd make the awards and the announcements and that, they had the college jazz band playing. And this college jazz band was just, I, mean, I remember, they were playing the, the old Space Odyssey, also Sprock Zarathustra rock and roll theme they were playing. And it was just like, wow, blow your face off. And, and I'm sitting next to him and I go like, wow. I said, someday, I said, I want to play in that band. And he said, well, you're going to have to practice. I said, you darn right, I'm going to practice. Well, I didn't know at the time, but his brother was directing that band. Uh, uh, Ronald Caviani at Northern Michigan University. So anyhow, Mr. Caviani left at the end of my seventh grade year. I had uh, another gentleman my eighth and ninth grade year, and it was not a very good. It was not a very good uh, situation because uh, uh, the guy just had too many other problems. I've kind of since learned going on in in my life. You know, he had too many outside things, uh, family troubles, and. And, you know, he wasn't as a uh, really good teacher and he did, wasn't really well grounded in all the fundamentals of all the instruments like Mr. Caviani was. But I, I hung in there, went to high school, got in the high school band with Mr. Swanson. And uh, Mr. Swanson was, uh, he'd been there forever. You know, he was like one of the coolest people in the world. And, and I remember uh, at this Super Bowl, uh, there was a Super Bowl game my sophomore year and uh, the guy was in Dallas, and the guy from uh, from Dallas played the Star Spangled Banner with solo trumpet. And um, came in the next day on that Monday, and Mr. Swanson came up to me and he goes, "Did you hear the the Star Spangled Banner yesterday at the Super Bowl?" I said, "I sure did, Mr. Swanson." He said, "I want you to do that at our basketball games." I said, "What?" He said, "I want you to play that at our basketball games." So lo and behold. For all the home basketball games, I would walk out to the center of the basketball court and play the Star Spangled Banner until the bridge. And then the band would come in on the bridge and I would do the bugling part over the top, you know. And oh my gosh, it was just, you know, I, I didn't have any problem with it. I enjoyed playing it and he liked it and the crowd liked it and people liked it. And they, they remember it to this day. And, and the next year, the school district installed a spotlight that would shine on the American flag and then one right over center court. And they did that for the national anthem. And, and so I did that through high school, went to solo and ensemble, went to interlock in one summer. And, uh, went to music camp every summer and it was just a, an incredible experience. I didn't know how lucky I was with Mr. Swanson because he was the high school band director. He was the best band director I knew and he was the worst band director I knew, you know, and it wasn't until a few years later when I had uh, graduated from college and gone out teaching. Uh, I've been to an event at uh, Bands of America in Whitewater, Wisconsin, and John Painter had taught uh, had, had spoke there. And I listened to Mr. Painter. In fact, I recorded his talk and I came back to my hometown and I saw Mr. Swanson and I said, and he asked me how I was doing. I says, Oh, I'm doing great. Mr. Swanson. I, and I, he said, um, uh, what have you been doing? I said, I just heard John Painter speak at, at bands of America. And he laughed and he said, how in the hell's Johnny and Johnny? Oh yeah. Johnny and I went to college together at Northwestern. He said, he, he sat ahead of me in the clarinet section, but I, I played ahead of him in the stage band. And he says, Oh yeah, I go to Chicago and I see Johnny. And, and, you know, I left at that point in time and, and I kind of lost a little respect for Mr. Swanson here. I'm going like, well, what happened to you? You know, Mr. Painters, Dr. Painters at Northwestern and international name, and you're still at Iron Mountain high school. But it took a few years to, to, to settle in. And I realized that had there never been a Mr. Swanson in my life, there would have never been a John Painter. So the most important person in that equation was my high school band director, was Mr. Swanson. And, and he, he supported me and he guided me. And when I graduated high school, I went to Northern Michigan University in Marquette. And I met a guy by the name of Tim Watsonheiser, who was the percussion teacher and assistant director of bands and directed the Golden Variety Show Band and the, uh, a group called the Fantastics, which was a 10-piece vocal instrumental show group. 
And I was just scared to death of this guy. I mean, he was hell on wheels and he was just great. And I just loved playing in the band. And I remember as a freshman and we kind of, uh, Tim and I laugh about this to this day, but it was hot and it was fall. And I was a big kid. I was really fat. I was like 260 pounds and, you know, and I'm trying to march and do the old Big Ten high knee lift and stuff like that. And I could play the trumpet. I mean, I could play and I could play loud, you know. And he came down off the tower and he came right up in my face and he says, can you play any louder? And I didn't realize that he was being facetious at this point, right? And, and I said, I said, well, if you let me stop marking time, sir, I think I can. <laughs> and, and we laugh about it to this day, but, but Tim was, was just, Dr. Tim was just great. And I just love him to death. He's like my brother right now. And, and so he was at, my, at Northern Michigan. And in the second year, I performed with this vocal instrumental show group. And then he took a job at the University of Missouri. And um, uh, so I, I wanted to go with him. And my folks says, no, stay at Northern and see how it goes. Well, uh, the replacement came in. And along the way, I guess the chairman of the music department had told uh, Dr. Tim, he said, don't you touch Mangini. He said, he's our best trumpet player. We don't want to lose him. And he said, I'm not going to touch him. He said, I'm not going to try to take him away. He said, he, I understand. And so the new band director came in and, and he made a new band director mistake. And he's a good guy. And I know him and we've talked a lot since that day, but he made a huge mistake. And he basically told the band that everything we were doing up to this point was wrong and that he's got the right way to do it, you know? And, and it was like, I'm going like, wait a minute, buddy. I've invested two years of my life in here. You can't tell me what I invested is wrong because we had a good time and we played well and all of that kind of thing. And, and, and I did not see eye to eye with this director and he knew it and I was pretty vocal about it. I was kind of being a jerk probably about it. But I guess halfway through the semester, the chairman of the music department called Dr. Tim at Missouri and said, you got to get this kid out of here because he's going to kill our new band director. So I transferred to University of Missouri, finished my degree there in 76. Tim at that point had taken a job at New Mexico State and I was going to go with him to to be his graduate assistant. But I came back through Columbia, Missouri on my way to New Mexico and I said goodbye to the director of bands, Dr. Alex Pickard. Dr. Pickard, one of the great men in the world. I just love him to death. He was my trumpet teacher and he helped me so much. And, and so he goes, Mangini, what are you going to do? And I said, well, Dr. Pickard, I'm going to New Mexico State. I'm going to be Dr. Tim's uh, uh, graduate assistant. He says, you need a job. I said, well, I'm going for a graduate assistant. He says, you ever had interview for a job? I said, no, sir, I didn't. He said, well, you need to introduce your job. He said, there's a great job open in Kansas City, high at Winnetonka High School in North Kansas City, Missouri. He said, they're looking for a band director. School starts next week. He said, you would be perfect for it. He says, I'm going to call him. So there was another professor on campus that Dr. Pickard knew that knew somebody in North Kansas City. Anyhow, he called him and, 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 and basically said, you got an interview tomorrow at three o'clock in Kansas City. I'm in Columbia at the time. I'm going, like, well, what am I going to do? You know, well, he, do your best. He says, you know, you've got some stuff that you've done. And, and one of the things that I had done through college was I kept a three ring binder. And every time I had a program or there was a picture or a newspaper article or something, for some reason, I clipped it out and got one of those page protectors and stuck it in and put it in this three ring binder. So I had, in essence, I had built a portfolio without realizing I had built a portfolio. You know, they didn't call it that in those days. <clears throat> so I came out of from Dr. Pickard's office and there were two ladies sitting in the basement of Jesse Hall who Dr. Pickard would have coffee and tea with every day and I would once in a while. Helen Bachman and Virginia Tate. And they said, what are you doing? I said, well, I just found out, I said, I'm going to New Mexico, but I just found out from Dr. Pickard, I'm interviewing for a job tomorrow. And, and, and one lady said, where is it? And I said, well, it's at North Kansas City High School and it's North Kansas City uh, School District. It's at Winnetonka High School. And she perked up and she says, well, you have to come up and see Chancellor Schooling. I said, Chancellor Schooling? She said, oh, yes, you know, Chancellor Schooling was the superintendent in North Kansas City uh, before he took the position here at the university. I said, you're kidding me. She said, no, you come right on up. So 10 o'clock, I go up and I'm in Chancellor Schooling's office, scared to death. I'm in shorts and a t-shirt. There's some, some dean or professor trying to get in to see him. And she goes, no, he's completely booked for the rest of the week. You know, she's like being a great defense for him. 
And I'm going like, well, if Chancellor Schooling's busy, and she just kind of said, no, 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 he's expecting you. So she went in to see, to see him, and she comes out. She says, the Chancellor will see you now. So I walk in, and here he is walking around his office, and he's got a football, and he's throwing a football up and catching it. And he's just walking around his office. And he stops, and he turns, and he goes, looks at me, and he points, and he goes, trumpet player. I said, I said, yes, sir. And and when when I was playing in the in the mini Mizzou band at Missouri, at the end of basketball games, Chancellor Schooling would walk by, and Doctor Tim would make sure we all said hi to Chancellor Schooling, you know. But he said trumpet player. So we sat down, we started talking. He wanted to know about the job, and I said, well, I pulled out the paper, and I said, well, I'm going to interview with a guy by the name of William Scott. And he kind of laughed, and he said, oh, Billy Scott. He said, I hired Billy Scott when I was teaching here in the summertime. I'll call Billy this afternoon. Okay, so that night I went to Jefferson City High School. Uh, that's where I student taught at Jeff City with Jerry Hoover, who went to was at New Mexico and then ended up at Springfield, right at Missouri State. And and Jerry Hoover uh, and I'm I'm talking. He goes, "Well, you got interview questions to ask." And I said, "Mr. Hoover, I don't have nothing to ask." And he says, "Well, let's write down these interview questions." So. He helped me with the interview questions, and, and I was going to take his son, Doug, to New Mexico to start his college degree when I went, when I was going with me. So he said, well, who's this interview with? So I said, eh, this guy by name is William Scott. And he goes, I wonder if that's the same Bill Scott that I played clarinet with in the Drury College Band. He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call him. So long story short, the next day I go up and I interview at 3 o'clock in the afternoon in Kansas City. It's about 115 degrees. I'm in a three-piece suit. Uh, uh, I walk in and I, I I have to come in through the through the janitor's entrance and this guy picking me up is in a, in a t-shirt and shorts and and his the assistant principal and his name is Homer Corn and and I just like oh boy this is too good to be true so I go up and I interview for the job and and it was it was a long interview hour and a half and I had my book and I showed him that and. Um, then I went over to the central office. It was probably about 5.30 when I got to central office and there was Bill Scott there. And I walk in and he goes, if one more person calls on your behalf, he said, I'm going to kill you. And I guess that there had been about eight or nine calls about me for this job from doctors, Chancellor Schooling and other professors and Mr. Hoover and all that stuff. And so I finished the interview, drove to New Mexico and on about a hundred miles out, I called uh, Kevin Lepper, my buddy who was already down there and, uh, you know, had to use a pay phone in those days. And he said, man, a guy from Kansas City called. You need to call him back right away. And he gave me the number and I called back and they offered me the job. And um, uh, I said, well, can I get to my destination and I'll call you back? So I got to my destination. I called my parents. They said, take the job, jumped in the car. I drove back to Kansas City. So I left there on a Tuesday afternoon, got to New Mexico on Thursday, drove back. I got like back into Kansas City sometime Friday afternoon. I walk into the high school principal's office. I've not shaved in four days. I look like hell. Principal looks at me and says, who are you? <laughs> I said, I'm the guy who just hired <laughs> your band director. And he says, man, you need some sleep. So I went over to a, I went over to a Howard Johnson's Motor Lodge and, and, uh, and got, a, got a room, came back and started. Well, school meeting started on Monday. And, and, you know, and the place was a mess. The instruments were a mess. The uniforms were a mess. The music library was a mess. And I had to go to these meetings. And I mean, I spent hours there. Well, school started and now I'm in my first teaching job. And first day of school and I gave him the old hellfire and brimstone. There's a new sheriff in town, blah, 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 blah. And, and uh, I'd said, okay, uh, get out your instruments. And I didn't notice as a new teacher that nobody had an instrument except one kid, Paul Brewer, sitting in the back row. He's playing baritone. He had one of those plastic con baritone cases. Nobody else had their instrument. And I'm going like, you're in band. They go, oh, we never play our first day. Well, you're going to play your first day now. Get out of here and go get your instruments. So I threw the whole band out, made them call their parents and get their instruments because there was a seminar period at lunch and we were going to practice. So... Uh, principal came down and says, you know, you shouldn't do that. I says, well, we got a football game Friday night and I told you we were going to march and by God, we're going to march Friday night and they're going to play, right? Five days of school, no extra rehearsals. So the Democratic National Convention had just come through Kansas City and Jimmy Carter was going to be the Democratic uh, candidate running against Gerald Ford. And I remember from college that we had done this goofy halftime show where, where the band was basically stood in a block band and 
and we held up signs that were printed and it said Ford and we did baby elephant walk. And then we had signs that were Carter and we did sweet Georgia Brown. And then we put them into a computer and it was going to predict who the winner was. And of course the big TV show at that time was all in the family. So the winner was going to be Bunker. And we had signs that said Bunker. And we played the theme from All in the Family. And then we were supposed to play the fight song and come off the field. So we had it. It was perfect. We rehearsed it all week. Marched down the field with the fight song, which they could get through. Use their flip folders. Play through the three pieces, which would at least sound somewhat okay. And come off the field with the fight song. Perfect. So the first week of school, we go to um, the football game. And it's about 10 minutes probably into the game. And I said to my drum major, I said, you got the signs? And she looked at me like, what signs? I said, the ones we've been painting all week. Oh, no, I forgot them back at school. So I had to have an assistant principal go back to the band room and haul these 20 pieces of cardboard signs, these huge cardboard signs to the football game. So he did that for me. So we got to halftime, lined up in the end zone, and we had it all worked out. She was going to call four whistles. And, and the band was going to do a roll off and play the fight song down the field. Well, she, before the four whistles, when halftime went, she had to call the band up to the, to the goal line. Right now, we're at, the, we're at the end zone line. We're at the back of the end zone. So the halftime run, and I didn't, you know, I'm, I just, okay, Sherry, take it. So she calls the band to attention, and I'm not, like, tracking with this either. Calls the band to attention, gives them the whistles, and half the band moves up to the to the goal line, and the other half the band does the roll off and starts playing the fight song going down the field. And it is the biggest mess you have ever seen in your life. I mean, there was like a glob of six kids, and there were 35 yards of space, and there was one kid standing, and then nine kids, and four kids. And I mean, it, it just looked like, oh, and this is like, like, it looked like there was a case of measles on the field, you know? And, and so we got there and, and we find the band didn't really get through the fight zone. They just kind of gave up at a certain point in time. You know, they got there. And uh, uh, the next thing was uh, uh, we got through the songs and we came off the field. And it, I was so embarrassed and so frustrated. And who's standing by the by the sign, but uh, by the by the sidelines, but Dr. Pickard and his wife. And he was laughing and he said, it's going to get a lot better, Mangini. He said, just hang in there. So I, I've talked way too long about, about all that. But it was, a, you know, an interesting start to, the, to, a, to my band directing years. And I guess the point there for people is, you know, uh, you're going to make a lot of mistakes and you just got to be persistent and keep at it and hang in there with it, you know. There are two major threads that I, I was following as you talked, and the one we'll, we'll kind of go in reverse order of the way they were presented. Sure. And you mentioned you mentioned that that first year you went in and you were fire and brimstone, then you had that opening football game was a bit of a disaster. How did that first year go? You know, we, we often don't want new teachers to go in and try to change everything that first year. Well, it wasn't a matter of change. It was It was just a matter of I didn't look at it as change. I looked at it doing the right thing. You know, and I look back at it and yeah, I did change some things, but I went into a situation um, and, and, and for those listeners who who know the Kansas City area, the director I followed was a great musician and he's a great guy and I have a whole bunch of respect for him, but his love was jazz. He wanted to do jazz. That was his big thing. He didn't, you know, concert band was okay and, uh, and marching band was terrible, hated it, but he loved jazz band and he had a great jazz band. They were killer. And in the area, there were two other high schools, one in Park Hill High School. The gentleman's name is Bill Mack, great, great teacher. And there was a, a director up in, up in Liberty, Missouri, by the name of Eugene Holt, had a great program at Liberty High School. So I'm coming into this thing, and I, and I didn't realize it at the time, but you know, I had a lot of experience in marching band and show band and things like that. So I put my energies in the marching band, and, and, and I created a basketball band. I still did jazz band and all those things. Still did concert band. I listened to some of those early, early concert band tapes that I had. And the band was pretty, pretty decent. Didn't realize, you know, but I, I hadn't really learned how to do it yet. Hadn't figured, hadn't broken the code on it yet, you know. And um, uh, uh, so 
you know, they were just so happy that the band was doing well and that the kids were excited and that the band was playing at basketball, showing up at basketball games and playing at basketball games and doing a good job at home football games for the first year. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, I was, a, I was a good team player for them and I was, I was trying to do the best I could. So I got a lot of support from my high school principal then. Uh, his parents were former music teachers, so. You know, I look back at it. I, I, I guess I would have I wouldn't have done anything any different. You know, I had some some definite ideas. But but the thing that I'm going to allude to is the fact that because I was putting my energy in the marching band and basketball band kind of thing, I was kind of like alone, alone there in terms of I didn't have a lot of things to be compared to wow, uh, at those other schools. You know, and uh, that was kind of dumb luck more than anything. Mm hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The other thing that was really resonated through your your story was how you had all these connections. You know, you you your high school teacher, your your trumpet teacher, his brother was um, the director of the jazz group groups at Northern Michigan, and then you met Dr. Tim, and then that took you to Missouri, and then all these people helped you either get to New Mexico or to your first job, and so these connections, and and we see this among people who are very successful in the band community. They're very well connected. They seem to have all these relationships, and I talked a little bit about this with Mark Scatterday about the same concept, but what causes that? How do we harness that as as musicians? Well, that's an that's interesting. I think. First of all, I think you got to be very respectful of, of everyone as, as much as you possibly can be. Uh, my father being a salesman, you know, I, I learned how to talk to people. I watched him interact with people and and you, you take care of people. And I remember one thing that kind of sticks with me. I was a young kid and my father was working in the yard doing something. And it was a hot day. And my I, I, uh, I went up to my father and I said, would you like a glass of water? And he just stopped and he turned on me and he said, he said, uh, if you want me to have a glass of water, get me a glass of water. If I want to drink it, I'll drink it. But don't ask me if I want it because in hopes that you, you don't, you'll think I'll say no kind of a thing, you know. So in other words, what he basically said was if you see something that you can do and you want to do it, then do it. And, and you know, the, the, the thing that I remember was and the thing to this day is that you know, random acts of kindness don't cost you anything. When, when I was at the University of Missouri with Dr. Pickard, a cup of coffee or a cup of tea cost 10 cents. That's not a whole lot of money, even for a college kid way back then. So if, you know, I, I'd go in and, and, and I could see that Dr. Pickard's office was open and, and I'd go get myself a cup of coffee and I'd get a cup of hot tea and I'd walk it down and I'd I said, here you go, Dr. Pickard. I'd leave him a cup of hot water in a tea bag. And if he wanted it, he'd drink it, you know. And he would go, oh, man, he said, you don't have to do that, you know. And and like Dr. Tim would have drink like Diet Cokes or Diet or Tab or whatever that drink was then. And, you know, I'd bring him a Diet Coke. I wasn't trying to suck up or anything. I just thought, man, these guys are working hard and they they don't normally take a break from what they do. They're, they're staying at it. And so they'd probably like something to drink, you know. And and I so I, I kind of did that along the way and and learned to, to you know, communicate with people. And, and uh, what I learned from Dr. Tim along the way was that, you know, the the communication stops when the last person stops the volley. You know, the ball goes back and forth. I mean, in, in our interactions with you, I've always tried to respond to you and acknowledge, you know, your communications with me, which have been beautiful, by the way. And and I just think I just think that's important that we look at what other people do and it's valued and you appreciate what they do. And I think along the way, you do make a lot of connections because uh, you let people know that you're interested in them and that you appreciate them. And, and you also appreciate what they bring to you, what they offer, what they give to you. Not that you demand anything from it, but you recognize uh, the inherent value that they add to your life. You know, I, I talk about my high school band director, Mr. Swanson. When he died, I happened to be out of the country. And it killed me that, you know, I couldn't be there to, to attend his service. So in order to deal with my grief, I wrote him a letter. A posthumous letter, obviously. And and what came out of my mouth was, you know, Mr. Swanson, you opened so many doors in my life because you never slammed one in my face. And and that was kind of the you know, kind of what he did for me. And and I try to do that 
you know, with other people. I try to keep the doors open. I try to help them as much as I can. Um, and some people accept it and some people don't, you know. Um, but I was all in. I mean, I, I was. I wanted to do my very best. I wanted to be the best at what I could do, or with my limited skills, and you know, as, as much as I could do. And and so you do that. And and you know, as Stephen Covey says in his book Seven Habits of Highly Effective People, you have to increase your circle of influence. You know, and, and there's a lot of people out there that you know, you just a, a random thank you is something that they never get. You know, you talk about excellence and um, you were a band director. Were you at Winnetonka for the, your full 18 years as a high school band director? No, it's it's interesting story. Here we go. More connections, right? Okay. I, I was there for nine years and, and about the eighth year, um, the district went through a reorganization where they went to middle school and and they went from beginner band in, in fifth grade every day to uh, uh, seventh grade every other week, five days on, nine days off. And I was trying to get that changed and it was just terrible. And it was just terrible. And, and I alluded to the fact that the high school marching band was, was, was really good. I mean, we had, we had gone to the, won the music bowl competition and they were good and we didn't, weren't competing a lot, but we just did a couple of regional things and, but they were very, very good. They were, they were terrific. And, and we'd go to the, like a local festival at Blue Springs and we'd win everything, you know, flags and dancers and percussion and horns and drill and marching and best bus drivers and all that bull, you know. And uh, after this change happened, I mean, I was killing myself to try to keep some semblance of quality because the kids were coming in and couldn't play their horns. And, and I guess the straw that broke the camel's back was I went into my principal's office in November. This was the second year of the of the of the impact uh, after the kids started coming in and uh, we won every count every every category at this festival of blue springs but we were third in percussion so i'm writing the announcement for him to read and he looks up and he goes you mean the percussion only got third and i just kind of went off on him and i grabbed the announcement out of his hand i said you have no idea how hard we're all working to maintain this level i said maybe next year we'll all get third and you won't have to won't have to point to that. Or I said, or maybe we'll get nothing next year at the way it's going. And I just kind of stormed out of his office. Well, that was the beginning of the end of that relationship. And uh, and so about the end of, uh, towards the end of the spring, I had gone in one more time to see him. And we were trying to get it changed. And, and boy, it was a heated two-hour meeting. And he didn't like me at the end of that. And I, I was no holes barred with the guy. And the next week he called me in his office. He said, Mr. McGinney, today I'm going to talk and you're going to listen. And he said, you're burned up, you're burned out, and you need a new career. That's all. And I said, what? He said, that's all. You can leave now. And I walked out and I started crying. I go, like, oh, my God, you know, I'm burned out and I need a new career. I mean, I wasn't fired because I had tenure. And I walked down, my wife was a home economics teacher and I'm crying and she goes, what's up? I said, I think I just died. You know, well, what? And I told her what happened. And, and uh, so I got home and I was a mess. I called Dr. Tim <laughs> and I go, you won't believe this. He goes, well, he said, and he called me Bobo and there's a long story there. He said, Bobo, he said, let me tell you what. He said, there's something going on in this guy's life that you don't understand. He said, what you need to do is you need to write him a thank you note because he's trying to tell you to get out of there. And I said, write him a thank you note. I said, I want to burn this guy's house down is what I want to do. You know, but no, I, so I wrote him a thank you note. And I said, you know, call him by name. And I said, I just understand everything you said. And I appreciate you being honest with me. And I'll take it all to heart. Sincerely, Charlie. And I put it in his mailbox on Monday. Well, Friday, I get a call from Robert Foster, the director of bands at University of Kansas, who was then the president or first vice president of the National Band Association. And he said, he said, well, the National Band Association is having their annual convention in Knoxville. We would like for you to bring your Winnetonka band and be a marching band exhibition for our convention. And I said, well, Professor Foster, you know, I said, I'm really honored. But I said, I don't plan to be here next year. And he said, where are you going to be? I said, I have no idea, but I'm not going to be here. And he said, there's a great job open at Olathe North High School. He said, it's got a lot of potential. He said, I'll call on your behalf. So long story short, he called on my behalf. I got an interview, went in on Monday, signed the contract on Friday. 
And so I spent the next nine years at Olathe North High School in Olathe, Kansas. And um, I was the high school band director at one of two high schools when we started. It ended up as three high schools, and now they got like 17 high schools. I mean, the, that district is exploding. But, and I was also the district band chairman. But a, a funny side note to that is about seven years into that teaching, the personnel director called. I was over at the central office, and the personnel director was there. And he was kind of in a jovial mood. And he said, Charlie, he said, I never did thank you for the raise you got me. And I said, the raise I got you? He goes, yeah. He said, you know, superintendent, he said, didn't like what was going on at Olathe North for a whole lot of years, he said. And, and uh, he said, every year we would go to the NAIA basketball tournament at Kemper Arena. And our band from Winnetonka, our basketball band, played the semifinals at the NAIA at Kemper every year. We played two games. And unbeknownst to me, the superintendent, the personnel director, and the assistant superintendent sat about 18 rows behind the band. So he saw how I worked with the kids and treated the kids and the discipline and how well they played and all that sort of stuff. And the superintendent leaned over to the personnel director and he called him by name and he said, why in the hell can't you get me a band like that at Olathe North? And he said, so the day I signed you, he said, I called the superintendent i said remember that band you wanted from the naia and he goes yeah he said i did one better i got you the band director and he said and i got a raise because i hired you <laughs> so i spent nine years at olathe and then during that time i worked on my doctorate with uh, gary hill at the university of missouri kansas city conservatory yeah that leads me into it because so then you, after this you went to vandercook where you were there for 23 years I was there 23 years. In fact, uh, I had applied for several jobs. I was a finalist at two before Vandercook. And I got the job for Vandercook. And I went up there and it was um, it was not a good situation. I'm just going to be very honest with you. Uh, there was a lot of great history there. They had gone through some they had gone through some turbulent times. The old guard had pretty much aged out and they were certainly in a in an in an extended transition, let's call it that way. And um, I interviewed for the job and I had to go up and do um, a conducting class. And the gentleman who was teaching undergraduate conducting was one of the alums and was a high school band director. Good guy. Very good musician. But, you know, this was just, kind of, he was just kind of marking time there. And he was, the kids had a binder full of Xerox scores and he'd play recordings and they'd just kind of wave their arms through the scores. And so I, I'm being, I'm interviewed and I'm at this conducting class and, and there's this young man and I said, well, what, you know, what exactly are we doing? What are you working on? Well, we're getting ready for our, our, our undergraduate final, second semester of undergraduate conducting, the final exam. I said, what is it? He said, well, we're supposed to conduct this piece called octet. And I said, octet, as in like the Stravinsky octet? And he goes, yeah, that's the guy who wrote it, Stravinsky, yeah. And I go, I go, I go, you're kidding me. He goes, no, he said, he said, we're supposed to go through this because he said, well, you know, the uh, Mr. I won't call him by name, but he, says, he said, you know, we just need to learn how to, how to be able to change meters. Well, I had done a week long doctoral seminar that summer. And the piece that we studied that summer was the Stravinsky octet. And I'm going like, there is no way in the world these kids can do. So I said, well, show me what you got. Well, the kid grabs a baton and the baton is just like, it looks like a foreign object in his hand. So I spent the first probably 20 minutes of this, just teaching him how to grip the baton, how to hold the baton, how to take out a proper ictus, bring it back, take a breath with it. And, and I kind of worked the whole class on the basics of just giving a downbeat, you know, and I figured, well, I'm dead. They ain't going to hire me. Uh, but lo and behold, I, I, you know, they hired me. So um, I called Tim and he said, you got nowhere to go but up. He said, you know, you got nowhere to go but up. He said, just go in there and work your fanny off. And, and so I accepted the job, worked there a couple months. I told my wife, I said, Wanda, I said, it's going to be uh, it's going to be 10 years of slave labor to get this where it's respectable. And after 10 years, I went back and I said, I lied. It's going to be 15 years of slave labor. You know, but it was it was it was enjoyable slave labor. We did good work and, you know, made some progress there. Yeah, well, I would say, uh, you know, the Vandercook program, especially the summer master's program. I mean, this is one of the, the most respected programs. And, you know, I had Max McKee on the show once. And I mean, I think when people ask for summer programs, it's the ABC and Vandercook are number one and two. ABC was kind of founded. Uh, 
uh, when one of our uh, senior professors, Victor Zajac, and, and Max were in ABA together and uh, talked. And I think at that point in time, Victor was a little disillusioned with what was going on at, at uh, Vandercook and encouraged Max to, you know, and, and basically shared a lot of our curriculum ideas with Max. And uh, yeah, that Max does a great job out there. That's a great program. There's so many great summer programs. I don't want to say anything about anyone else, you know. Well, and, and the whole online thing has changed the whole game for everybody. So, you know, this is what I, I kind of keep circling back to this. And something you said very, very early in our conversation was um, about having a director who wasn't grounded in fundamentals. And, you know, one of the things that I'm concerned with as I sort of transition into a new job teaching beginners is, you know, it's been a very long time since I had music education classes. And how does one get better? How do we achieve excellence? And how do we how do we get better at these things? Well, that's a great question. Um, well, obviously, it's a process. It's a lifelong process. Sure, you know? sure. I, I, think, I think you have to kind of take an honest assessment of what you know and build on what you know and, and continue to fill the gaps in – what, from what you don't know. Don't focus on, for instance, what you don't know. So, for instance, my I'm, I'm a trumpet player, so I'm comfortable with trumpet and I'm comfortable with trombone and French horn and tuba and euphonium, you know, to lesser degrees. And then we get over into the woodwinds and I'm comfortable there, but boy, I'm, I'm a far ways away from it. You know, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable with percussion because I did some private study in college on that. I did some private study. Instead of taking technique classes, I did private study in, in violin and viola, and I was much more comfortable with that than woodwinds. I was, you know, oh boy. But it wasn't until I really started my doctorate studies and I started taking private lessons in clarinet and saxophone and, you know, did some master classes in oboe and things like that that I started to understand those instruments better. So I, I guess it, it boils down to knowing what you don't know and, and working on those things, you know, one at a time. Um I'm a great believer that people want one of three things in life, Mark. They want they want affirmation first, affirmation. They want to be affirmed that what they're doing is, is good. It's, it's a good thing for them to do. The next thing they want is they want inspiration. They want, to, they want somebody to jazz them up and, man, I want to do this. When I walked into my seventh grade band and I heard Maynard Ferguson playing trumpet with the Stan Kenton Orchestra, man, that inspired me. I wanted to do that. I wanted to be that guy. When I listened to those Doc Severinsen albums, I wanted to be Doc Severinsen. It inspired me. The third thing is information. Once we're, once we're affirmed and inspired, then we need to be informed. And I think a lot of teachers affirm kids, and I think to a certain extent they inspire kids. But sometimes they don't have the information. So if a kid is playing, a beginner kid is playing the trumpet and they can't, they can't get it going, they can't make it happen, they can't buzz their lips, they can't, right? And the, and the teacher doesn't have 52 ways to teach them how to buzz their lips or how to get the airstream going or how to take a breath or, or what are the kind. And just says, no, no, you need to blow harder, you need to do this, and the kid can't get it, then that kid gets frustrated, right? Because there's no information there. At that point, all the affirmation and inspiration in the world doesn't help that kid get to that next level. You know, we have to have the affirmation and inspiration in order to get to the point where we can inform the kids. So when, when, when those directors and those elementary directors that are just incredible, that, that can, you know, they can grab a clarinet and play a clarinet and they can play a saxophone. And I mean, that was one of the great things about the Vandercook curriculum is that every kid had to learn to play every instrument. I mean, they weren't virtuosos in it, but they could pick up an instrument and they could get a good sound on it and, and learn how to play every instrument. You know, I think, I think that's what kids want. So in the case of this junior high school band director who didn't know everything, I mean, there would be things that would be going wrong. And he wouldn't be able to tell you what they were. It was like, okay, do it again. Well, do what again? You know, make the mistake again? I mean, he wasn't able to clearly listen to it, articulate the problem and say, this is what we need to focus on or break it down and work on this, you know. Uh, so that's a whole other skill set. So I think for younger teachers, be honest with yourself and say, you know what? I just really don't know. I just don't know how to teach flute very well. well. Go take a semester of flute lessons at the local college or university or find a local flute teacher and say, I want you to give me a semester of lessons and, and spend, you know, spend a few bucks and spend a few hours and learn how it goes. And, and, and it'll, it'll make all the difference in the world. You know, I was at a, I was at a, 
a session at the University of Kansas one time, and I went to a clarinet master class, and Larry Maxey was the clarinet professor there, and he had Larry Combs from the Chicago Symphony there. But there was a dean that did a like a music ed master class. And it was as simple as this. He said, when you look at the clarinet ligature, realize that the screws have always got to be to the player's right. The screws on the ligature are always to the player's right. Well, there are some of those newfangled ligatures that the screws are on top or the screws are on the bottom. So I went back to my high school band on Monday and I looked at the section. And would you know that two people had their ligatures on upside down? And I looked at it and go, hey, you got to turn your ligature upside down. Screws are on the player's right. It was that one little piece of information made a difference for those two kids' lives. It's, you know, it's, it's those kinds of things. Yeah. And, you know, that that's a lifetime of knowledge to get to those places. You know, you have to spend lots of work is something you've been talking about is that it just takes effort. Well, yeah. And, and as you said earlier, you know, when we were offline talking about people that go to conventions and work, I mean, they've got to go to those and they've got to listen and they've got to take notes. You know, they've got they've got to go. They got to bring a notebook with them. They got to bring something to write them down. And if they don't write down something that the person says, at least write down a thought that went through your head while they were saying it. You know, so you've got something to to take with you when you're done. You know, and I think too many people go there. They're wide eyed. They listen, but they don't remember. You know, the, I mean, I, I when John Painter spoke, man, I had my tapes. I listened to those tapes a hundred times. Those were my notes. You know, I mean, it's just important that that you because there's so much information. You know, when when people, you know, when they listen, when they read journal articles, when they listen to podcasts like this of of the many great people that you've had on here, if something strikes their fancy, they need to write it down so they don't forget it. You know, and then every once in a while, just go through your notes and go, like, oh, yeah, this I got to remember this. I got to remember that. That's how you build your knowledge base. Yeah, I, I use Evernote, which is on my phone. And every time I hear something, I stop the podcast and I, I write it down. Like when I'm listening yeah, to other great. podcasts and I, when I go in through and I edit this episode, I'll listen to things that you say and I'll write them down like uh, screws on the players right on the ligature. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm excited to announce the Everything Band podcast has joined forces with several other music education related podcasts to form the Music Teacher Development Podcast Network. The Muted Network provides support in the form of audio on demand programming designed by and for music educators. You can find more information about our network at mutedpodcasts.com. All right. So, Charlie, the first of these questions that I ask each of my guests is um, where do you draw the line between healthy and unhealthy competition and music? Well, I think I think you, there's competition in life. There's going to be competition, and I, I think you know it's going to vary from from person to person, from situation to situation. You know, I'm probably one of the most competitive people you've ever met in the world, but that doesn't mean that I have to go and 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 be competitive against someone else. I think I think in certain cases, um, the whole aspect of competition. Um, for some, becomes kind of a rites of passage. Uh, let me let me explain. Uh, there's two basic kinds of competition, right? There's the festival kind of competition where you go for a division one, a division two, a division three, and then there's the competition where you're going to go and you get a 98.6 versus a 98.2. Those kinds of competitions, and and I think they both I think they both have value. Um, uh, I but I I think that. You use them to get the students to perform at a higher level. That's why we have concerts. We have concerts, otherwise kids would never practice their music. They'd never learn it. So we, we, may, we manufacture a goal. So we manufacture a contest to take it to the next level. We say, hey, you're going you're gonna to be out there performing against another group. You don't want to look bad. You don't want to sound bad. You don't want to embarrass yourself, do you? You know? Um, so in many cases, we're kind of like the, the music mother that says, you know, you don't want to go out and look stupid and have people laugh at you. So you got to get your act together. So I, I think I think for some, I think that's really, really important. Um, and then it, for some, I think it becomes a game of high stakes poker. You know, I mean, when I go to Las Vegas, if I put two dollars in a slot machine, man, I think I'm going to lose my life. You know, and there are people sitting there gambling thousands of dollars. Uh, that's what they like to do. You get in a competition, I think, provided that it's in balance, provided that everybody understands what you're doing and why you're doing it, and you can articulate that very clearly, I think I think it's great. 
uh, there, are, there are certain people in our profession who've been competing at a high level in certain areas for, for decades. And they seem to have a great program and their kids love it and the people love it and they have a way of keeping it in balance. When competition comes only as the result of, of beating someone or not doing your best, but just to win, then I think it's, uh, I think it's bad. Uh, I, I always use the analogy that, you know, that band was one class in a school day. And of course, in my situation, when I taught, we never had an extracurricular competition group. Marching band met during the school day. But, but in, in any case, band was a, was a one class in maybe a six period day. And I said, you know, if band takes up more than two nights a week out of a kid's life, all of a sudden, it's getting out of balance because we're, we're, try, we're demanding more time than we need to with those kids. You know, now there can certainly be opportunities where there's there's extracurricular things that they can do. And, and, and if they choose to do that, I think that's all well and good. But uh, but I think I think there's a, just a balance point. If, if you're not comfortable competing, then don't compete. If, if, if you're not comfortable going to a situation and, and looking at those kids at the eye and said, kids, we did our very best, you know, and uh, I'm proud of you and we can grow and we can learn from what we did today. I think it's healthy. Um, if you go there with the idea that you're going to beat everybody and you're going to win and then you come in 26th place out of 26, it's pretty devastating, you know. Um, so it, it, it's I guess it's just a matter of, of your own personal perspective, what you're comfortable with. And and uh, and making sure that you put the kids' best interests first, you know. Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I often, as I listen to people answer this question, you know, I've talked to people who are extremely competitive marching band and people who are just don't like any sort of competition. And to me, it always seems to come down to that. What are you comfortable with? What can you handle? So long as you're doing whatever you're doing in a healthy way, I don't think there's really anything wrong with it. Yeah, you know, in, in when I first started teaching. In, in my very first year, there was one competition that the band did, and it was around a shopping center. In Kansas City, they had this big livestock show called the American Royal, and they had things. Well, this, this one shopping center did a promotion. They called it Salute to the American Royal, and it was a weekend sale of extravaganza. But they had a parade that basically went around the circle of their shopping center, right? And, and of course, there were three schools in the district and all three high schools had a march in this shopping center's parade. I mean, that was kind of like, you're expected to do that. Well, I didn't know any difference. So this was the salute to the American Royal Parade. So the first year we went, and of course now you got two other high schools in the district, you gotta be the best because that's what you gotta be in that district, right? You gotta win. So we finished second to the other high school and they were pretty happy, but you know. Well, the next year we finished first out of the three bands, my second year. And, and we got back to school and there were parents that showed up and they had like a bottle of champagne that they opened because we won this. I look at it now and I just kind of laugh. I mean, it was ridiculous. But to them, it was bragging rights. To them, it was like so important, you know. And so it's easy for that to get out of hand real quick. All right, Charlie. Uh, this question was suggested to be by Mary Land. Um, I don't know oh, I know. love Mary. Yeah, Mary's great. Yeah, absolutely. And she she put this in my podcast. <laughs> How do you find work life balance as a teacher or a musician? Well, balance is an interesting word. I used to um, um, talk about this in my graduate class, and if you can if you can envision a teeter totter, and you've got the fulcrum right in the middle of the teeter totter, so if you could put a like-sized person at each end of the teeter-totter, then the teeter-totter is going to work really good, right? And But if I put a 300-pound a, a person on the end of one leg and a 20-pound person on the end of the other leg, guess what? It's going to be out of balance, isn't it? Right? But if I move the fulcrum way towards that 300-pound person, and there's a much longer part of the teeter-totter where that 20 pound person is, I can achieve balance there, right? So balance is a balance is a, is a relative term. For, for someone, balance is, I'm gonna, I'm gonna work, I'm gonna show up at 7.30 and I'm gonna go home at four o'clock and I'm gonna give my very best during that time. 
And, and to them, that's the perfect balance. To other people, they're going to say, I'm going to go to work at six o'clock in the morning and I'm going to work till seven or eight o'clock at night. And I'm going to go in on Saturday morning and work till noon. And to them, that's the perfect balance. So I think balance, again, is going to be different. There's going to be a lot of factors in there. Uh, are you are you single? Are you in a relationship? Do you have children? Are there other obligations in your life? I mean, you have to take an honest look at where you are and what you're doing and all of those kinds of things. Uh, and, and, you know, I mean, I was fortunate. I had a wife who was very supportive. You know, we've been together 38 years. She understood. She was an athlete. She's a coach. So she understood those kinds of things. But so that balance is, is important. I think the key is, is that you have a calendar and you honestly take a look at a week long calendar and you plug in all of your obligations for that week. And then if there are things that you want to do for yourself, then you, you pay yourself first. A good money manager will say, when you get your paycheck, pay yourself first. A good time manager will also say, when you take a look at the time that you have for the week, you pay yourself first. So if you want to do something on Thursday night, but you're not sure what it is, then put something on the calendar. And somebody says, well, can you do this on Thursday night? And you look at your calendar and say, sorry, I already got something on the calendar. <laughs> you know, I mean, you have to protect your time. And, and it's, going to, it's going to vary. And there's going to be times that we're going to be more busy and there's going to be times that we're going to be less busy. But, but I think it's taking a realistic look at, at, at managing your time. I mean, you, 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 uh, you manage your time and you prioritize your things. You don't manage things. You manage time. And so the best time managers are the ones that are able to find that work-life balance. All right. So this is a big question. Um, what are the challenges that are facing music education and band and how can we best meet them as we move forward into the 21st century? All these challenges have been around forever. <laughs> uh, they're the same. They're the same ones. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's being a, a teacher who cares, who has an inherent care, has a desire to, to give kids a good experience is willing to work to, to achieve that end, is to is able to provide a little bit of discipline in those kids' lives, is able to understand that there are multiple uh, multiple facets that they have to deal with. For instance, I, I would say that there's five food groups. You know, there's students, parents, colleagues, administration, and community. And we have to make sure that we tend to all five of those food groups. You know, you speak to parents different than you speak to kids and you speak to your colleagues different than you speak to parents and you speak to administrators different than you speak to your colleagues. And so there are certain ways that you have to go through and, and make sure that you meet, help to meet the needs of all five of those groups. So, for instance, with a colleague, it's very easy in music that you're a lone duck. And if you have some success, people can really look down at you pretty quick or you can, you know, you're, you're a loner or you're by yourself or you don't. And, and sometimes, you know, it's just a matter of reaching out and recognizing how hard those people who are less visible than we are, are working. And when you walk from your band room down to the office to get your mail, keep your eyes open and look at those classrooms. And if there's a teacher that's lecturing or there's a teacher that's got a project going on, make a mental note of those kinds of things. And when you see that person and, you, and you know, you go like, hey, Joe, how you doing? Oh, I'm doing good. Hey, listen, I walked by your class today, man. You were lecturing up a storm. What's going on, man? Those kids were writing and, and engage them and let them talk about their favorite subject then. You know, and, and, and I think if you do that and you let people know that you care about them, all of a sudden that care starts coming back and they start valuing what you do. But, but you have to model that. You have to model that with your principal. You have to model that with, with, your, with your colleagues, with your parents, you know. I mean, parents have one reason that they support you. They're there for their kid. Parents don't like music. Parents love their kids. That's why when their kid graduates from your program, the parent doesn't show up for your concerts anymore. Right. So understand that when you're talking to parents, you're talking about their child and how good their child is. And their child, you know, you are a great parent for giving music to their child. And my God, now, which one of you are which one of you are the musician in your family? And you'll get that chuckle. You know, I can't even play a radio and that kind of thing. But I mean, the challenges are for you to be a good musician and to be aware of all the things around you and try to try to say, OK, how can I get them to buy into this music and how can I how can I get them to support what I'm doing while I support what they're doing? 
and and it's that it's that that give and take uh, that uh, that's that's music advocacy right music advocacy needs an advocate and and what you do as an advocate is music advocacy in your community i mean we can you know the old saying you think globally but you act locally right so you you get students to go once in a while to the school board meeting and thank them for the opportunity to travel to play at a festival you thank them for the opportunity or thank them for providing new instruments or you you go over and you say thank you to them because school boards never get thanked School boards have irate parents who are complaining that the bus missed their kid's stop or that their school lunch program has too much cheese in it and their kid's lactose intolerant, you know? I mean, they, they never get thanked. So it's a matter of seeing what they're doing and seeing what they're doing for you and offering thanks. And I think by doing that, you build up this incredible network of support. And, and so those challenges tend to go away, right? I mean, because you're not fighting them, you're embracing all that stuff, and and they understand that you're you're a part of the culture, right? You're a part of that. That music is a part of that that school culture, and it's needed there. Yeah, yeah. Can I share two quickly two anecdotes that sort of illustrate what you're talking Absolutely. about? Absolutely. The first, my father was a teacher for 54 years, and when I got my high school job, one of the things he told me before my first parent teacher conference that always stuck with me is remember that those children are their most important thing in their parents' lives. If you lose sight of that in that conference, then you're going to get lost. You're going to get, you're going to say something you didn't mean to say or something that's hurtful. That was really important for me. And the other thing is just the other day, just on Friday, I have a, a young student and I probably shouldn't say too much, but he, um, he's struggling a little bit with, um, sort of staying attentive and staying on task. And I, I, I thought one of the things I could do is maybe take five or 10 minutes out of his day next week and uh, try to spend a little one-on-one -on -one time. And I went to his teacher and I asked her and I saw the look flash across her face. It was very quick, but it was like she was annoyed with what I asked. And that's because I forgot her needs. Mm -hmm. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's, it's really easy to do. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's that's amazing. And I've been no, teaching for exactly right. 22 years. It's not like I, this is not my first time around the block, you know, but you can still oh, yeah. make the mistake. Yeah, you, a, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. That you are so right. It's it's her needs, right? Right, right. Yeah. Right. All right. So I like this question a lot. And that's um what advice would you give your younger self, perhaps the 18-year-old Charlie on the high school dais at mm. the day of your graduation? Mm. What would I give myself? Spend more time in a practice room as, a, as an undergraduate in college. I get that answer uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess enjoy the ride. It's a journey. It's not a destination. I think young teachers, at least I'll speak for myself, I wanted that destination. I wanted to arrive. And so you constantly, you're so focused on things that you miss, you miss the little moments that make all the difference in the world. Uh, I was teaching at Vandercook and I got an email from a young man who said, uh, you know, one of those, you don't remember me, but well, he went on and I do remember it. It was a Friday night. It was in North Kansas City on, at a Presbyterian church on Shoto Traffic Way. And our jazz band was playing for their chili supper. And the lead trumpet player that night was sick and couldn't make the jazz band performance. So this kid got to play lead trumpet. This kid was not a great trumpet player. He was a good trumpet player, not a great trumpet player. And so he goes on to talk about the fact that he played this solo because the other guy was sick. Well, the solo was an old Doc Severinsen, Henry Mancini piece called Brass on Ivory. And it was actually a thing that Doc did on flugelhorn. So the kid's reading me and he goes, I was feeling especially strong that night. So I took the last note up an octave, which means instead of playing low uh, bottom line E, he played top space E on the trumpet, you know, so. He was being especially strong. And, and he says, I'll never forget the smile you flashed me when I did that. Now, I, I say, I don't know if a smile, I don't know, I think it was amazement that the kid could really play that high. I wasn't sure, you know, but, but for him, it was a smile. And he said, in all the years of band, it was my favorite moment. It was my favorite moment. 
And, and he said, and now my son is learning to play the trumpet and I want him to hear the music that dad played. And Mark, I sat there and I wept like I was three years old. And I said to myself, my God, how many kids along the way didn't I give that smile to? How many kids did I give a frown to or look over the top of my glasses at or say something rude back to them? How many did that? So, you know, when you're a young teacher, look for those things to celebrate. We're so hard on ourselves. We're so driven. You know, we've just come out of a curriculum that teaches us error detection, right? That, that way we take classes in ear training so that we can find out what's wrong as opposed to what's right. And so we got to look at those things and say, and say, you know, this is a journey. It's going to, you're going to take a job. It's going to take you five or six years to start that program to develop. Enjoy that development. It's not going to make it come any faster. It's not going to make it come any slower, but you got to sit back at the end of the day and go like, you know what? I did a couple of things today that are pretty good. I got, I got a reason to come back tomorrow. And, and I think that's what I would tell myself. Be a little bit less hard on yourself. Still be as driven, but in, enjoy those smaller victories a lot more than you did. All right, Charlie. So I asked this question not to be morbid. It's not a morbid question. It's more about what's special, what's special to you. And that is, if you if you had a choice, what would be the final work for wind ensemble or band? And I, I've opened it up over the years to orchestra as well, to anything. What would you like to conduct last? Uh, I, remember, I remember being at Grant Park in Chicago, and Doc Severinsen was playing with the Grant Park Symphony. And sitting in front of me was the legendary principal trumpet of the Chicago Symphony, Bud Herseth. And, and Mr. Herseth was just great. And I got to know him pretty well towards the end of his life. I mean, not great, but pretty well. He, his wife and would go to the Thursday night concerts at Orchestra Hall and then go into the little restaurant at Symphony Center and have a glass of wine and an appetizer. And my wife would follow him right in and sit at the next table and we chatted and he'd come to Van Cook and talk to our kids and then. But as he was sitting there, he said, some kid went up to him and, oh, Mr. Herseth, can I get your autograph? And he was so generous and he gave me the autograph. And he said, he said, Mr. Herseth, he says, what's the favorite piece of music you've ever played? And without missing a beat, he turned to the kid and he looked him in the eye. He said, son, the piece that was on my music stand, that was the piece that was my favorite. And, and I look at that and I go, gosh, there's, there's so many unbelievable works that have been written for our band wind ensemble medium that are just and it's just such a, a relatively new media you know but but i i mean i think you have to have just as much passion for a grade one piece as you do for lincolnshire posey you know you need to have as much you, you need to play it with as much heart. You need to play air for band with as much heart as you play Ingolf Dahl's Sinfonietta. You know, I mean, so, so there's, there's so many great pieces. I mean, you're, you yourself are a composer. And, and if I've got your piece on my podium, I have a responsibility to make that the very best piece of music it can, I can make it sound like, you know, now, certainly there are some pieces that are strictly written for educational purposes. You can obviously tell this piece was written to emphasize the dotted eighth sixteenth note. This piece was written to emphasize this or that. But but many cases they're not. I mean, even in grade two, grade three pieces, grade one pieces. You know, uh, for that kid, that is Lincolnshire Posey for a, for a kid that's playing in fifth grade and that's playing a grade one band piece. Right. So we better do the very best job we can with it. You know, from, from a selfish standpoint, the final work, I, I don't I don't know. I, I don't know. I haven't you know, I, I, there's so many pieces I would love. Um, I think I think it would be unfair. Um, I mean, it, it could be anywhere from from, uh, you know, from Lincolnshire Posey to the Holtz first suite to a Sousa March to a you know, uh, selections from My Fair Lady to the best of Willie Nelson. Hell, I don't know. I mean, you know, I like so much music. I, I, I'm all over the map with it, you know. So I guess it, I, I guess my favorite one would be the last one I get to do. All right. So, you know, you mentioned that whole idea of the kid, the fifth grader, the sixth grader. You know, I, I when I write a grade half, like a grade point five, six notes, you know, concert B flat to concert G, you know, to mm -hmm. me, I feel like a great responsibility. This might be the only time, the only year that this kid plays his instrument. 
And you're right. I, I don't want to write a piece of music that isn't going to be, I mean, even with six notes and eighth notes and quarter notes, I want to write a piece of music that's going to be memorable for that kid. Yep. 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 I can't agree more. I cannot agree more with you. Yeah. I was a music major and I have a career in music because of the, the Granger Irish tune. I have no doubt. Oh, about sure. That. Playing that in high school sure. changed the, my course. Okay, so Charlie, is there anything coming up that you'd like to share, promote, knowing that this will live on the internet for a long time? No, I'm still pretty, you know, I'm still not real active. I'm retired. I spend, uh, uh, try to spend a lot of my winter in California uh, and Palm Springs where I can play a little golf, but I'm still very active um, with Hal Leonard Corporation. I'm a co-author of the Essential Elements book and and, uh, all the good things there. I'm doing a lot of presentations at upcoming uh, state shows. I also am a senior educational consultant for Con Selmer. So they have me going places from time to time. And, and uh, uh, you know, I'm still active. Uh, I've been writing some articles for various journals and publications and, and um, uh, you know, just trying to, trying to enjoy things a little bit and, and offer the limited amount of wisdom and knowledge I've accumulated after 43 years of teaching. But, uh, you know, i uh, I think, you know, I think people just have to understand that it's a, it's a process. And, and, and I guess one of the other things that I'd like to have people remember is there's a difference between a problem and an inconvenience. Uh, three years ago, uh, October 24th of 2015, I suffered a massive heart attack. And I'm supposed to be dead. I mean, I was in the Upper Peninsula, Michigan, my wife drove me to a little, on the way to a, like a regional hospital, I had an ambulance meet our car and they stabilized me. I took a helicopter ride to Green Bay, Wisconsin, 100 miles away, and they did emergency surgery on a Saturday night. And I survived it. Um, and and I, through that, I realized that that was a problem. <laughs> when you have an emergency heart attack surgery that you have the widow maker, you're not supposed to make it, you know. Other things are just like a little inconvenience. When a kid forgets his instrument or forgets his music or drops his mute or talks when he doesn't remember that he shouldn't be talking or is chewing gum, that's an inconvenience. That's not a problem, right? I mean, he may be forgetting his music or his instrument because he's having problems, and that could be a good signal to you as a director that you need to do some intervention there. You need to do some diagnostic work to see if... Maybe the kid doesn't know the fingerings or he doesn't know the names of the notes or he can't read rhythms or something like that. There's some diagnostic things there. But oftentimes those things are inconveniences. And along the way, teachers tend to take those things personally. And, and after a while, they lose their perspective. And when you lose your perspective, then all of a sudden you become negative or you become defeated or something happens to you. And it, it completely changes that bright-eyed, bushy-tailed, optimistic kid that graduated college. And now all of a sudden you become a, a pretty much a bitter, uh, unhappy person who has been sentenced to a life sentence of showing up at school every day and teaching until you can finally retire. You know, so for people to just remember the difference between a problem and an inconvenience, I think is huge. Yeah, that's uh that music educator, that band director from college told us once that the ideals of bright to teach music are still valid when the going gets rough. I still remember that, mm, you know, you can't, good. you can't lose sight of that. Um, why you got into it because you know, there are going to be times invariably when it seems harder than it, you know, not worth it or too hard or <laughs> whatever it is that it is that goes to your head. <laughs> and we've all been there, right? Of course. Sometimes every morning. Yeah. <laughs> but, you know, the more, but you know, the more you push at it, it eventually it's going to, it's going to be better. And the other thing is that, you know, as, as teachers, I mean, we don't get a chance to see, we don't get a chance to see the tree grow. You know, I mean, you can plant a tree in the ground and you can water it and nurture it and give it give it food and protect it and sunshine and energy. And that's what you need to do. You need to trust in that process. And and in five years, you can go back and like, oh, my God, that tree really grew a long way. Well, the same thing is true in our music. We don't we don't hear kids progress. You know, that, that's why it's important for a teacher, you know, early in the year. Let's let's take a piece of music and let's record it and let's just put it away and then 
when you get up to about a week before the concert, say, I want to play a recording of what we sounded like a week ago or two weeks ago or three weeks ago. And they'll go like, they'll start laughing because it'd be so bad and say, here's where you sound today. We're making progress, aren't we? We're getting better at this, guys. Let's keep going, you know? And uh, so I think there's uh, so many different ways that we can we can share that with kids to keep them involved and keep teachers involved that they are they are making a difference. You know, they are making an impact. Charlie, so we, we barely touched on on the things that I wanted to touch on. So I really appreciate your time. It's been terrific. Well, I am. On, listen, Mark, I am honored that you took the time and could schedule me in with the num with the, with the so many great, great, great teachers that we have in the world and the luminaries there. I mean, to be considered to be uh, uh, one of your guests is, a, is certainly an honor for me, and I, I'm deeply humbled. Uh, Thank I you. I appreciate that. So, Charlie, how can people get in touch with you? Well, email is the best. Uh, it's cmengini, C-M-E-N-G-H-I-N-I at iCloud.com. And I will always respond to people's emails. Uh, it may take me a couple of days, but I'll get back to you. And... Uh, uh, I love to hear from people, love to answer questions. We have some help, anything we can do, because um, it's important. You know, uh, that that first time I put that instrument to my face and and made a sound and my eyes got real big, I'm sure. And it's like, man, that's pretty cool. You know, it's, and that that can become addicting, provided that we got the right people guiding us along the way. And and that music can uh, can change our lives, you know, and if there's something that I can do to help someone on their journey, whether it's a student or a teacher, I'm happy to do that. I owe it to the profession to do that. Charlie, thank you so much. Thank you, Mark. And, and God bless you and God bless everybody that's listening and uh, hope that we are past cross again soon. Okay. Okay.